So welcome back to the lecture series in uh, animal physiology. So we are into the fourth class of the twelfth week. So today we will talk about the kidney. So before we talk about the kidney, we have already talked about the respiratory system. So there are two levels, two major levels. There are other places where it, the purification does take place. There are two major levels where the blood is getting purified. One is at the heart where it is getting rid of the carbon dioxide and it is again rejuvenated by binding it to binding to oxygen. This is one place. The other place where it gets purified is the kidney. Kidney is a structure where it gets rid of quite a good amount of uh, urea and all other salt kind of everything and retain a huge part of water. It is a very tricky process if you think of it because this is a filtration assembly where the cell or the body has to ensure that it retains maximum amount of water, it should not get dehydrated and yet it, it, it has to get rid of the unnecessary salt or metabolites which it does not need. And if you look at the cross section of the kidney on the slide which is present here, it is a very interesting structure. So here you are having blood entering, here you are having the blood leaving which is the veins and this is where the stuff which kidney has purified or kidney has rejected, has to be rejected, has to be thrown away. So why it becomes challenging is, say for example, I am removing something from the blood. So that is a solid stuff. Now the solid stuff also needs water to be thrown out of the body, right? So now when I am pulling it, so I may be pulling out a lot of water also while I am filtering. So now if I pull out a lot of water from the blood, what will happen? The viscosity of the blood will be compromised. So I needed other sources, I mean I have to ensure that I, so there is no other source of water coming into the system, right? So I have to ensure that I strike a balance by virtue of which I do not lose so much water that body becomes dehydrated, okay. So that is where it becomes a very tricky problem and if you look at the structure again, it has a medullary part and it has a cortical part. So whenever you see a structure, you realize the outer periphery is called cortex, this is the cortical part, okay and this is the inner core is called the medullary part. This is all medullary part. Now it has renal pyramidal, so it is kind of a pyramidal shapes you see, these are the pyramidal shapes sitting there. Okay. So these are the renal pyramids and the renal capsule which are embedded into it. Let me move on to the next slide. So if you look at the structure, so this is the renal artery which is moving. This is your renal vein which is coming out. This is the ureter and this is the cortical region as I was showing you. This is the renal pelvis and this is the renal medulla. And each one of these, the lines which are coming out, these are the smallest filtration assembly which is called nephron. If you look at the structure of the nephron, it is something like this. It becomes narrowed down. So there are zones where it will get narrowed down and it will become thicker. Okay. And after this, this will take a very interesting shape. So as you see, so if you follow this structure, something like this. So I'll come to the let us see the bigger picture. So this is where all the blood vessels are entering here, which is called the glomerulus. This is efferent tubules, these are the afferent tubules and here you can see it much better. So this is the Bauman capsule, now keep a tab at this part. 
So this is where the blood is entering, where I am kind of drawing it. So at the Bowman capsule, the part of the blood moves into the Bowman capsule through a filtration, okay, which is also called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Now from here, the movement of the fluid starts. And in this whole channel, what is happening is that the blood is continuously being filtered out and ensuring the maximum amount of water is being retained and all other salts which are present there are slowly kind of got rid of, okay. So this is how the structure looks like and this is what you see the afferent arteriole. So this is basically the enlarged version of this part you are seeing here. This is that enlarged version. Okay. This is that enlarged version where and this is what you see this assembly, this is structural assembly, this is out here. This is where all the filtration is taking place. The first set of filtration that this is called the lumen of the Bauman capsule. So you could see these are the glomerular capillaries, these are the podocytes and this is where most of the first set of filtration is taking place. So blood is moving like this and moving out like this, efferent, A2 and it comes out. And these are the endothelial cell lining. And this is where the first set of purification starts, okay. Now, what exactly is happening here? You have to look at it carefully. Now, you saw the previous picture, which was kind of a two-dimensional effect. Now, here see the three-dimensional effect, what is happening. So, so the blood is kind of spreading out in several zones and out here, there are small, 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 small podocyte-like structure. And this is precisely the zone where this kind of filtration is being happening. And then whatever the fluid comes, it moves into the nephron for the fragments or further segment of the nephron, okay. Something like this. Now the structure of the juxtaglomerular apparatus, a functional relationship between the cells, the JGA or the juxtaglomerular apparatus is composed of five different cell types, which includes your macula densa, MDCS, juxtaglomerular granular epithelial cell, which is the renin secreting cells, vascular smooth muscle, VMSCs, mesangial cells, MCs and endothelial cell ECs, okay. Now, you can see all these different cells are arranged at different spots out here, RSCs, VSMCs, MCs and these are those gap junctions, okay. So, this complex layer, what you see here through the efferent and the afferent arteriole and all these things. There are different cell types which are taking care of. So here you have the glamour RSCs, okay. Then you have the mesangial cells which are present here, out here mesangial cells. So all these different cells and then you have vascular smooth muscle cells, okay, which are present here. So this is kind of giving you, this slide is giving you the feel of the mapping of the different cell types present in the kidney mapping of different cell types in kidney. Now this is giving you even a much more better feel how it looks like. This is how it moves like this and this is the three dimensional assembly what you saw and goes back. And this is where you have all the different cell types which are present there. Okay, and these are those macula densa and all those other things where all the processes are taking place. And this is the sympathetic and parasympathetic connection which are regulating all the different processes which are getting involved in it. So the process which is happening includes filtration which is the mass movement of water and solutes from plasma to the renal tubule that occurs in the renal corpuscles 
about 20% of the plasma volume passing through a glomerulus at any given time is filtered. This means about 180 liters of fluid are filtered by the kidney every day. 180 liters, just kind of look at this number, okay. Thus, the entire plasma volume, about 3 liters is filtered 60 times a day. Filtration is primarily driven by hydraulic pressure, which is the blood pressure in the capillaries of the glomerulus, okay. Note that the kidney filter much more fluid than the amount of urine that is actually excreted, which is about 1.5 liter per day. This is the amount of urine what we secrete every day. This is essential for the kidney to rapidly remove waste and toxins from the plasma efficiently. Okay. Now moving on to the other aspect of it, there is a reabsorption which is taking place. Reabsorption is the movement of water and solutes from the tubule back to the plasma. I told you there is a lot of reabsorption happening. Reabsorption water in a specific solute occurs to varying degree over the entire length of the renal tubule. Bulk reabsorption which is not under hormonal control occur largely in the proximal tubule. Over 70 percent of the filtrate is reabsorbed here. In addition, Many important solutes like glucose, amino acids and bicarbonates are actively transported out of the proximal tubules such that their concentrations are normally extremely low in the remaining fluid. Further bulk reabsorption occurs of sodium occurs in the loop of Henle. Regulated reabsorption in which hormones control the rate of transport of sodium and water depending on the systemic conditions takes place in the distal tubule and the collecting duct. Even after filtration has occurred, tubule continues to secrete additional substances into the tubular fluid. This enhances kidney's ability to eliminate certain waste and toxin. It is essential for the regulation of plasma potassium concentration and maintaining the pH. Here comes the role of the renin angiotensin system. So the renin angiotensin system, if you look at it, so this is where the angiotensinogen is being secreted. This angiotensinogen is converted into angiotensin, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 goes and hit onto the adrenal co cortex, leads to the aldosterone secretion. Aldosterone secretion eventually leads to the tubular, tubular sodium and chloride reabsorption and not only that, angiotensin 2 directly leads to the sodium and chloride reabsorption and potassium excretion and water retention and further it activates the sympathetic activity. This also leads to the arteriolar vasoconstriction increasing the blood pressure. Further angiotensin 2 asks the pituitary to secrete ADH antidiuretic hormone which helps in collecting duct for water reabsorption. So water and salt retention effective circulating volume increases, perfusion of the juxtaglomerular apparatus increases. Now further when it increases, it tells it, there is a feedback loop which helps it to stop it. So this is how the renin angiotensin system, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So this is your renin angiotensin aldosterone secretion axis functions in regulating the flow of fluid sorry, along the vessel. So this is your renin angiotensin system. So now coming back to one aspect which I was dealing in the last class was about the immune system. So when you finish the blood, I told you that there are two aspects of our immune system which needs to be addressed. So one is called innate immunity, another one is called adaptive immunity. So innate immunity is essentially, though this in this course this itself is a subject in itself, so I will be just covering giving you an idea. So innate immunity is essentially the immunity which is already present. So one of the classic example, if you look at all these different kinds of uh, frogs growing in extremely dirty environment, 
it nothing happens to them. It's because their surface, body surface is covered with a whole range of molecules which are antimicrobial peptides. So similarly, in our body, at every orifices of our body, whether it's mouth, whether it is vaginal orifice, whether it's anal orifice, whether it is ear, whether it is nose, every orifice of the body has this lining of antimicrobial peptides. They are already there, irrespective of any reason they are already present in our body. So that kind of immune system, which is non-specific and yet present in your own body, constitute our innate immunity of the system. And innate immunity is very, very interesting if you look at it. Like, unless otherwise, so in order to get into your body, one has to breach the innate immunity. Otherwise, you cannot, you know, get into the system. Now, there is something called adaptive immunity. And there are, in between, there are certain adaptive steps which are involved in it. So, Once something crosses the innate immunity, it has to, or at once they try to breach the innate immunity, they have to, they will be, in, they will have to interact with the second <coughs> blood cell type, uh, uh, which is the white blood cells. So, as soon as they interact with the white blood cells, they signal a series of molecules which eventually triggers the adaptive immunity, which is regulated by the B and the T cells. You remember when I was showing you the stem cell, the bone marrow stem cell, how they differentiate, there are three lineages coming through and one exclusively separate lineage, if you went back to the, just the previous lecture I gave, one track was exclusively for the B and the T cells and I am talking about that tract. So, that tract is the one which is involved in, which is involved in your starting the adaptive immunity. So, the immunity can be divided into three parts. One is innate immunity, which is present in all of us and it is a very strong immune system. As a matter of fact, you will be surprised to know that the AIDS virus can be broken down by the molecules which are present in part of the innate immunity. But unfortunately, innate immunity molecules are very non-specific. So, they will not only destroy the AIDS virus, they will destroy our own cells. So, we really cannot, so you, you cannot, unless we target that molecule, we cannot really use it for AIDS. And then comes the adapter in between, which includes a white blood cell, neutrophil, basophil. And then comes the adaptive immunity, which is governed by the B and the T cells. So, this is the whole range of classification on which it works. And there is another thing about the blood, which is very interesting to note, is that where we I showed you that there is a capillary network which is happening. At the capillary network, there is another network which starts, which is called lymphatic vessels. So, lymphatic vessels picks up the, so at the capillary mesh, I told you that there is a lot of fluid which comes out from the blood vessels, right. Now, this has to be retained. Veins does its job, but still a large amount of fluid is being pulled out by a parallel system which runs along with it, along the circulatory system which is called the lymphatic systems. So, the lymphatic vessels picks up and it is the lymphatic vessels out here which also picks up all these immune molecules. So, if you see there are enlargement of lymph nodes and everything, it is basically that is where the WBCs are getting accumulated. So, the lymph vessels picked up, picks up this additional fluid and finally, it dump it on the vena covers in order to ensure that no unnecessary water loss does not happen. So, you see not only the veins are carrying it back, there are another supporting vessel in the form of limb vessels, which of course, have multiple other functions in terms of, you know, limb vessels are essentially designed to 
as soon as these WBCs engulf all these pathogens, it is the limb vessels which ensures to you know digest and rip them and kill them apart. So, with these little tail bits and pieces which are left, I will close in this lecture and we will move on to the last lecture soon after this. Thank you.